Good afternoon for those that are here. Uh, my name's John Alexander. I'm with the local chapter. And about three decades ago, I was down at uh, SOCOM headquarters, and I ran into a couple of majors, uh, <laughs> uh, Gus Taylor and his buddy Hawk Holloway, whom some of you uh, may know. And we've been in touch with uh, Gus for, you know, ever since. Um, one of the things that struck me at that time was a saying that was going around. Now, we're talking, again, early 90s, late 80s, somewhere in there. And the word that was out for us Vietnam guys is, uh, it, it's not your father's SF anymore. And, and that is certainly true, and you're going to hear a lot about that today. My guess is the people from, uh, you know, that are coming in now would see us as grandfathers. Another iteration uh, has come through. Uh, but uh, today, he, he's going to talk about, obviously, some stories, and one of the wars, of the things that were going on in El Salvador areas, some of the things that have happened that are not as well known as they were before. And so I'm going to let him uh, sort this one out, but uh, here he is, back from the dead. <laughs> yes? Hey, thanks everybody for showing up. I got the coveted 1300 right after lunch slot. So uh, I probably, can you all hear me back there? John is instructing me to use the microphone. Hang on a second. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's working. Okay, so anyway, uh, John invited me about, what, two years ago to come speak at this thing, and uh, uh, I was really uh, really surprised he did because I wasn't a Vietnam vet. You know, normally I'm pretty respectful of all the Vietnam vets, so I just wanted to kind of tell you the, the way this got set up is John said, hey, about half your audience is going to be Vietnam vets. So what I'd like to ask is for everybody who did not go did not go to Vietnam to please stand up. Okay, so for the Vietnam guys, this is your legacy. And these cats in here have all fought in wars since Vietnam. But this thing is not, don't hold your questions until the end. Do not. Call me out, float, throw the red flags down if you, if you see something you don't believe in or don't like. But what you're seeing here is kind of a collection of stories of, uh, that's the theme of it, is storytelling. So we want to tell stories that are illustrative, that kind of show what happened with your legacy after Vietnam. And what we're really trying to do is to get you all talking, because you're a real talkative bunch. It's really easy to get you to relax and just start yakking. So. Please talk, okay? In other words, when we're on a slide and something comes to mind, or something I'm saying, or some of the other cats here are saying doesn't sound right, or it does sound right, and you got a story to tell, please tell that story. And if we're here long enough, I'm gonna tell you the best story from Special Forces that I know. It's called Ernie and the Howler Monkey. And if we have time, I'll tell that story. But uh, uh, what we wanna hear from you all is, is, is stories about uh, how to win wars, because that's the uh, really big deal right now. It seems like we've lost the ability to, to win wars. So we want to hear from the Vietnam vets out there. So this is uh, something uh, we've been putting together that's uh, helping us to understand kind of the nature of what we're dealing with and why we're losing these wars. So uh, this dimensions now are something you can measure, like miles or feet or inches or hours. And the Army's got this all wrong right now. You can look up dimensions of war, and they say land, sea, and air, and they're actually domains of warfare that they're talking about. They're not talking about dimensions. So point warfare was good for us for human, as human beings for about 200,000 years. Monkeys fight point warfare. Basically, you're fighting over a very good piece of ground. You know, So that's the way warfare was till agriculture showed up about 10,000 years ago and we could actually have big cities and stuff like that. I'm getting around to where this is interesting, okay, I promise. You gotta do the... <laughs> so basically, you know, our ancestors clubbing themselves, you know, club, clubbing one another to death over high value terrain. And uh, that high value terrain looks a lot like patrol bases, right? I mean, it's high ground. 
You got some water around there. Uh, this particular one we're talking about has probably got some fruit trees, and uh, it's a valuable piece of terrain. So they're going to fight over that point. They're they're not out there uh, doing the warfare as we know it later on, because later on the maneuver warfare came when cities uh, were important, big cities with lots of land around them. So, and then of course you got horses and marching armies and all that stuff. So now we're in two-dimensional warfare, X and Y, right? Maneuvering around on the ground. And we still are. Maneuver, Sudi to maneuver warfare is still the big deal for a lot of what's going on. 3D warfare started around the Civil War, where we're getting up in the sky and down underneath uh, uh, the ocean. And we've added this third dimension up and down uh, to, to the warfare. And what's really interesting is uh, we got 3D warfare in the Army. We're almost all Army cats in here. We got 3D warfare at the brigade level, maybe, right, to where we can call in airstrikes. And so what I'm blessed enough, fortunate enough to be working on right now is uh, 3D warfare at the SFA team and squad level, our infantry squad level, where we're taking tiny UAVs, putting guns on them and grenades so you can fly them around the corner and go shoot somebody in the face without having to go around the corner yourself, right? So that's what I, that's what I do for my daytime job for the U.S. Navy right now. But, but the three-dimensional warfare, we have just barely mastered this, and I'd argue that until we got at the tactical level, at the squad and platoon level, we're not really doing 3D warfare real well right now. So fourth dimensional warfare, is there any physicists or tech geeks in the room? What's the fourth dimension? Yeah, a bunch of them, a bunch of geeks. Okay, so uh, this was the guy that always stuck in my mind as the master of the fourth dimension was Ho Chi Minh. And uh, no matter how good we were as special forces and that in Vietnam, he, uh, he, could, he could beat us by just waiting us out, right? So I checked around, like, where did he learn this from? He learned it from Mao, who was also really good at just wearing people to hell out. <laughs> so where did Mao learn it from? Old George Washington, who never had to win a battle and didn't win a whole lot of battles. And the whole uh, British Armed Forces were trying to figure out, you know, what's the cloth widths of stuff going on here? What's the, uh, what's the center of gravity? And they kept thinking it was the Hudson Valley. And they kept thinking it was, you know, maybe the Potomac River. What's, what's the center of gravity for the British Army? And it wasn't until many, many years later they figured out that the center of gravity for the, this war was George Washington's army. It was his army. That was the center of gravity. It wasn't a piece of terrain, you know, because all these dimensions I've talked up about till now, we're talking about terrain warfare, right? We're taking terrain and all that stuff. And George Washington knew he couldn't hold terrain, but he could hold them by the nose and poke them and jab them and just keep their, keep their uh, blood and treasure headed toward America and just wear them to hell out. So we had another group that learned from all three of these cats. And uh, anybody know who that might be? Another group that learned from these three pioneers. How about the Taliban? They just, they did the same thing that Ho Chi Minh did to us, did the exact same thing. They just wore us to hell out. And uh, I think anybody in the room here would agree with me that we should have left uh, some special forces in there. About, and, and about 2,000, right? About 2,000 special forces. And I did that. I told Bonnie that years ago that by my El Salvador calculus, which I'll get to in a minute, we should have never had more than 2,000 special forces in there. And we should have had a, a bunch of aviation and a bunch of uh, bombers. We should have had a really good, strong intelligence system. But we never, ever needed 30,000, 40,000 Americans in Afghanistan. But what we did is we copied failure. We copied failure from Vietnam. 
And we copied failure from the Russians. The Russians did the same crap. So we, we, we tend to copy failure, and I'm going to show you here later in the briefing where uh, I'm doing this so that the Vietnam vets, that you understand the legacy that you have left into the future because we learned, we learned from you, especially you NCOs and some of the officers, we learned what not to do in uh, future wars after Vietnam. Anybody in here know Wayne Downing, Wad? The Wad used to say, you never learn anything from a good leader. You just come to work every day, do PT, everything feels great. He says, you only learn from bad leadership. He says, you learn what not to do. So you all, the Vietnam era special ops, got treated pretty bad during and after the war from what we heard. I wasn't there. The, guys, the folks that stood up weren't there. But we know that after the war, they did everything they did to try to gut out special forces. They did everything they could do to uh, not use special forces and different stuff. But I'm talking about the big army. The they in this is the big army. So. Five-dimensional warfare, uh, if you read the latest army stuff, the fifth dimension is cyber. And they got it totally wrong there too. Cyber is not a dimension. You can't measure how much cyber you got. Cyber is a domain. It's a place where you fight. It's a place you can't see right away, but it's a place. It's not a dimension. So and I'm not going to get too deep into this slide. Otherwise, I have to get John Alexander to answer a bunch of questions. But we had a bunch, a lot of special back in special forces back in the days before we got fully rangerized, you know. So, uh, and I will tell you all right now, I'm gonna talk a little bad about rangers. I served for four years under Wayne Downing in second ranger battalion. So that's almost unheard of for an officer back in those days. So I love rangers, I love them for, you know, blowing the shit out of stuff, killing people, all that stuff. They're absolutely the very best, you know, but, uh, but anyway, uh, this fifth dimension of warfare, and I want people to disagree with me on this, at the fundamental level, and it's, it's the stupidest level, but it's religion, okay? Because you can sit there and say as a US person, hey, we're not in a religious war. And that's like being in an alley in New York City saying, hey, we're not in a knife fight. And the other guy's cutting the shit out of you, right? There's a, there's a spiritual aspect, which is a higher, plain than religion. There's a spiritual aspect to warfare, and this is where we're going next. And you're saying, well, if it's a dimension, how do you measure that? And there's actually a lot of effort being done to measure the stuff we called uh, WSFM. Anybody know what that stands for? Jay, you can't say. I know you know what it is. Weird science and F and magic, okay? So the stuff is real. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it used to be part of the special that was in special forces. We had guys like Billy Crane, you know, could snap the, the stem off of a, the, the neck off a Coke bottle without knocking it over, you know. We had uh, uh, Lenny, who I won't use his last name because he's still out there, but he was trained on how to drop a goat with his hand without striking it very hard, just touching it. And there's, I still got the pictures of the autopsies if anybody's interested in that, but that was real. And then we had the concerted effort by whoever to make fun of all that in a movie called Men Who Stare at Goats. So, and I, I'm not saying that this is something we should focus real hard on, but I'm saying this, we got to get away from being rangers. We got to get away from being pipe hitters because it's, it's a lot of fun and it's real easy to do, but it's really not what I, I think Special Forces is about. I think we got pulled into it, and I'll talk about that here a little bit. And so will some of my war buddies talk about how we got pulled into the rangerization of SF during the uh, Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts. So just a little bit about uh, what I've seen with conventional forces and insurgency. And I, I love conventional forces. I was when I was an infantryman, you know, second ID and all that stuff. So I understand that uh, they're very important. But there's some things they're good at. There's some things they're not good at. Counterinsurgency is one of them. Dave, uh, this is uh, Dave Morris here. 
You, you know the story about uh, Jim Parker when they were going to write the counterinsurgency manual? General Jim Parker. Anyway, Jim, General Jim Parker is, how would you characterize him? He's just a lovable guy, you know. He, uh, he's just a lovable guy. Anyway, so they told him, Jim, you're going to go to Fort Leavenworth, and, and you're going to sit down with this guy, General Petraeus, and you guys are going to write a manual on how we're going to win in Afghanistan in counterinsurgency. And when he got there, the story was that uh, they kept asking him questions like, so what are you, what, you, know, you know, General Parker, what's your input on using conventional forces for counterinsurgency? And he's like, if that's your definition of counterinsurgency, he said, I have no input because I don't know how to use conventional forces in counterinsurgency because you guys lose every time you try to do that, you know? So, and I don't know why I'm here, but I got sent here, you know, by, by Charlie Cleveland or whoever sent him, you know? So, when you're talking conventional forces and counterinsurgency, I was doing some research just on stuff I thought, uh, I've heard it all my life, so it must be true, right? So uh, one of the things I've, I looked at for conventional forces and counterinsurgency was the Indian Wars, because we won. I mean, we won the Indian Wars. But we had to burn villages, kill children, kill women, destroy their culture, re-educate them, move them off of their lands. So if you're willing to do that, turn loose your conventional force guys, if you're willing to do that. But the fact is we're not willing to do that. Then I'd always heard this story, and even, even Donald Trump said it, you know, it's like, he mentioned it, but basically, yeah, blackjack Pershing in the Philippines knew how to do it, you know. They shot a bunch of these folks, threw them in a ditch, covered them up with pig blood and threw dead pig guts in there. How many people have heard that story? I checked into it, and there's absolutely no evidence that that, there's no evidence that that ever happened, but what there is evidence is they uh, took machine guns and mowed down about 500 men, women, and children in uh, Bud Darrow, and that's their bodies, so. But there's no pigs in there, okay? That's an embellishment that, as near as we can tell, came later on. But again, you're seeing here a very successful counterinsurgency campaign, but a willingness to be greater terrorists than the enemy. So conventional forces, if you're going to do it that way, it's going to work. So I'm going to switch over here to uh, El Salvador, and we had conflicts, uh, the folks all in here, we've had conflicts that we were involved with Latin America, and we're going to take a look at Latin America because this was the best example of where what special forces in Vietnam did to really win future wars because every anguish that you felt in Vietnam was came out in your NCOs that took us as young officers and these old hardened NCOs from, from Vietnam and trained us on how to win a guerrilla war. And we had some officers too, not, it's not just NCOs, but it was a combined effort of officers and NCOs. And uh, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, we had, at the height of the war, we had 40,000 armed FMLN trained by Russian Spetsnats, uh, way better trained than the Taliban. And when they started out in Dave Morris's early days, uh, this is like an 80, right? There was 10,000 El Salvadoran armed forces, and they were mostly parade cats. I mean, they were like, right? So. So anyway, when El Salvador first started, before they sent Dave in, they did, the Army hated special forces. So what did they send in? You know this one better than I do, Dave. Can you, you talk to this? No, not really. I was otherwise engaged at the time. Okay, all right. Well, at the time, this was just before you were in there, but the idea was is, since we don't like special forces, we're going to send in Latino Rangers and Latino drill sergeants, and they're going to train the El Salvadoran Army in counterinsurgency warfare. It lasted about six or seven months, and the, the, the El Salvadorans just ran them all the hell out and said, these guys, they're pissing off all of our people, they're wrecking morale, you know, they don't know how to deal 
with our soldiers. You know, they're demeaning them all the time and all that. So uh, we need them gone. You know, whatever America's going to do for us, this ain't it. And in another vein, they sent in a bunch of colonels and sergeant majors. And the Salvadoran and Army's like, nope. We don't need colonels and sergeant majors. We need captains and senior NCOs, strong senior NCOs. So anyway, this whole idea of using conventional forces was such a good idea that General Milley created a new organization just to do things wrong, okay? Having learned this lesson in the 19, early 1980s, we chose to ignore it as a way of basically getting around the need to use special forces. I don't know how many of you vets are. Anybody in here is not familiar with the SVABs, the Security, Army Security Force Assistance Brigades? You guys know what they are? And they kind of got a brownish beret. They sort of had a brownish green beret when they started. And we all got so pissed off, we were writing letters to our congressmen and all that stuff. And if you look at the arrowhead there, it didn't used to be on a shield, it used to be all by itself. You know, kind of like our arrowhead. And for us, Chris, you got anything to say about the SVABs? Uh, yeah, it's public format. Oh, okay, okay, well. All right, but after the third rum of coke, you know, Chris and I are starting a new, we're both fashionistas. We're starting a new trend called Fat Commando. <laughs> and, yeah, right, yeah. But anyway, Fat Commando, the PT is really rough. I break a sweat every morning putting on my socks. So, seriously, I got to get back in shape because I've had five heart attacks and Kind of got to get rid. Got to got rid of get rid of this butter. So. So anyway, this is how we won the war in El Salvador. Two two Vietnam vets. Anybody in here know either of these two? Joe Stringham. John Wagelstein. They're not the uh, promotable types. They're special forces guys. You can see from the looks of them, they're not exactly uh, general officer material, right? Although I believe Joe Stringham did go on to get a star, if I'm not mistaken. So. Anyway, when the experiment with the Latino drill sergeants and Latino rangers didn't work real well, uh, they got these two cats. Now help me here, Dave, because I'm pretty sure you're a little more knowledgeable, but uh, these two together, or one of them singly, went to Congress and basically said two main things that turned into special forces lore in El Salvador and in Latin America, and that was we can start with 55 special forces guys. And it was like, we can start with that much. And they had no idea that that was gonna be locked in stone, so. And then the other thing they said, which is this is the thing that probably won the war, is don't give me any help I don't ask for. Don't give me any help I don't ask for. So, uh, anyway, these two cats, never met either one of them. But they were part of our campfire stories in uh, Colombia, El Salvador, Honduras, other places, Latin America. Can you say something, sir? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I Thanks, Gus. Uh, General Stringham was just here at the SOA uh, reunion last week. We got a chance to chat a bit. I went into El Salvador in 1980 with a communications team out of 37 in Panama. Uh, consisted of Gary Smith, Joe Sanchez, Sidney Vest, um, and Rick Ryman, if you know, know those guys. 
our assigned mission was to assess the communications capability of the Salvador military from a tactical to the strategic level. We were, de we were ordered not to wear bring our Green Berets into country. Uh, don't bring your berets, you can't wear them, so we didn't. And at some point, the U.S. ambassador at that time was, gave a CNN briefing up in D.C. and said there are no Green Berets in El Salvador. So, well, I guess he's technically correct, but that's not what the press was asking. Uh, Colonel, then Colonel Stringham, didn't come in to be the Mill Group commander until later on. I, I came back in 1981 with the team to train of what they called an immediate reaction battalion, although there was nothing immediate about it. They didn't have the uh, airlift or the capability to move anywhere in a really, really strong, quick fashion. Uh, but we had, I worked under two different mill group commanders who both were conventional army types, very focused on what the conventional army did and just did not care for us being there. But uh, luckily, we got some good people in on the mill group, such as uh, then Major Tim Gwynn, now Lieutenant Colonel Retired Tim Gwynn, who's here at the convention somewhere still, I hope. Um, so we were part of the original, what we called the double nickel. Um, Sergeant First Class Retired Greg Walker has written a lot of articles about those early days in El Salvador. But I can tell you that being limited to 55 special forces personnel on the ground was actually a good thing. Yeah, you're beating up my next slide, sir. Oh, okay, I'm getting on heading, but... That's a huge point. It was a good thing because that kept, that kept the politicians and big, big army and the big conventional forces from trying to make it a U.S. style war. Being only 55 of us and serving as advisors and trainers, the only thing that we could do was try and make them good enough to defeat the guerrillas. We could not make them mirror images of ourselves, which is, as you all know, is not something you need to do. They just have to be good enough to defeat the enemy at hand. Um, and, you know, that's just, just kind of the way it went. My team had a six-month tour went back. In fact, I ran past my d uh, and had to hustle out of Panama to get back up to the States after that. And then I was back in Honduras in 83, training Salvadorans in Honduras. And that was one way that we got around the 55-man limit, uh, but we were, we were able to train them in Honduras without really much interference as well. And they also sent a unit up to Fort Bragg for training. I can't remember which one. Um, and then they sent some down to Panama as well. Salvadoran military was not extremely professional. Uh, when we got them, I, when we came in the country, we were told, uh, yeah, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get these soldiers that already have combat experience, they know what they're doing, you're not gonna have to do a lot with them for the basics. You can give them some advanced tactics training and all of this. Yeah, wrong answer. Um, they, just, they just didn't really know what they were doing. We had to start with scratch with some individual training, squad, platoon level, and then eventually have a sort of a graduation exercise at the company level. And that's the way it was for, for quite some time at that level trying to teach uh, and demonstrate tactics. And I'll give it back to Gus for that. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, that drove uh, Ram Ramirez. Remember Ram? He was, a, he was one of our major heroes, five-tour Vietnam guy. And he would uh, teach you to tuck your shirt in so you could dump your magazines down your shirt, right? I got to tell this story. It's too funny because I, I first met Ram. I got into country. I'm on a one-year tour in El Salvador. Gorilla held territory. Chalatenango was the biggest mess you could ever imagine. So I'm in there. I'm loading up my magazines for my, you know, car 15, and I'm 
putting two ball rounds in and two tracer, and then I'm filling it up with tracer, right? And I'm filling it up with ball rounds. And Ram says, uh, sir, what the fuck are you doing, man? And I said, you know, Ram, B-52 tips of the trade, you know. Put the last two those, those rounds in there to signal you're uh, running out of ammo. He's like, how long you been shooting guns anyway, you know? <laughs> Since I was like eight years old, he said, did you ever wonder if you were running out of ammo? <laughs> you know? like, no, not really. He said, let me show you how to do this. So his daylight, this is his technique, right? His technique was your daylight, you know, two Claymore bags full of magazines, right? I don't know what do we have, 10, 10 magazines, 20, 10, 15 magazines, but your daylight magazines are 100% tracer for shooting out of helicopters or shooting squirters, and we didn't have all these high-speed red dot sights and stuff then, but, you know, Ram would teach the El Salvador to you know, get on these guys with tracers. And if you hit a guy with a tracer, it's like way different than hitting them with a ball, you know, especially in 5.56. Five, and then his night magazine had no tracers in it. You know, it's like, you don't shoot tracers at night, so what's wrong with you? you know? Anyway. Hey, yeah. Yeah. The point of that is, is we learned it's kind of hard to train them in the combat zone, especially if it's real conflicted combat zone. And so to get them away from El Salvador down to Panama when we trained the first 150 snipers down there at Empire Range, uh, to get them away from El Salvador and then send them back in did, was a technique that we learned that really worked. So uh, this is where we're getting into what uh, General Morris was talking about here. One of the things that we had a clue about is we had to have a plan and we had to have an objective, which we haven't had in Afghanistan in 20 frickin' years. Okay, so Colonel Pete, Lieutenant Colonel Pete Stankovich, uh, Jeff Nelson. Remember Jeff Nelson, sir? Anyway, uh, they sent a team up there to have the Salvadorans write their 10 year plan and the objective wasn't to get the FMLN out on the USS Missouri and sign a surrender agreement. You know, it was to get them to sign a peace accord, right? So totally different focus than we had in Afghanistan. Uh, the other thing, uh, besides peace being the objective, is what the 55 turned out to be a really, really good thing because we had one special forces guy for 1,000 El Salvadoran counter guerrilla infantrymen. So what does that make you do? Well, you're scared shitless, right, all the time. Makes you not get killed. Uh, the other thing is, uh, by the way, you didn't want to get killed in El Salvador because they would not simply torture you. They would peel the skin off of your head and let you die of sepsis. So the tougher you are, the tougher you're going to have it if you get captured by FMLN in those days. So we got sent in to stop. It was going on on both sides. So we got sent in there. Our, one of our main objectives was prisoner treatment. You know, do that different. Language fluency was a big one. You didn't go to El Salvador and use an interpreter. I don't remember anybody doing that. You know, you had to be at least 2-2 to go in there. Uh, and the other thing is we had full special forces provincial control over, like in Chalatenango Department, Morazan Department and all that stuff. Nobody went in there without your permission, without coordination. In other words, if you were a, a captain with three or four NCOs in one of these departments, nobody did shit in your department without you knowing about it. it the one exception was USAID, which did anything they wanted. Got to tell a USAID story on those cats in there. We kept seeing on, on helicopters, we kept seeing a new road up by Arcatau. The gorillas are putting in a new road. They got bulldozers and they got all this crap in there. It's like, whoa, you know, they're getting a lot of help from... Uh, Nicaragua or something, and uh, we checked into it. We found out that under, under a covered name, they went down to the Bank of Chalatenango, got a USAID loan to build a road in guerrilla-held territory. So, yeah, we didn't do everything right in El Salvador, for sure. But uh, 
The other thing, though, is the metrics. And the, everybody goes to sleep when you talk about metrics, but what was really cool, we go to Afghanistan, Chris will tell you, the Afghanistan guys will tell you, your metrics are KLEs, key leader engagements, patrols. What else, Chris? What else do they measure? That's big ones. Key leader engagements and patrols. Yeah. Med caps. Who gives a rat's ass about how many patrols you did, you know? The metrics in El Salvador was how many captured weapons did you have? Not how many bodies did you stack up? Kind of easy to stack up bodies if you really want to. It's not that easy to go take weapons off of the dead enemy or captured enemy. Uh, the other thing, we, it just started kind of under me. You may have had some of it started was prisoner treatment. I could never get any prisoners to get, to get our intel guys to interrogate them. I had to start offering a bounty for prisoners, 150 bucks for a live prisoner. The first one shows up, no fingers, no toes, no ears. I'm like, dudes, 150 bucks for a whole prisoner, right? We gotta get a, we gotta get a prisoner, <laughs> you know, that's like, you know, still got a, a mind. He hasn't, you haven't tortured him crazy, right? So anyway, we started getting uh, prisoners and, uh, and, and treating them pretty good, you know, still getting the intel we needed out of them. Uh, and, you know, basically the good treatment, that news gets around because everybody's cousins to somebody. I mean, if you've got a force of 1,000 people, 15% of those are infiltrators or at least sympathizers. And that 15% is held in every country I've ever been in. Afghanistan, you name it. You're going to have 15% roughly of compromised people. They're going to be either totally bad guys or they're going to have bad guys as cousins that they pass info to and all that stuff. So, so getting these prisoners, the word got back out that, hey, you know, you get three hots in a cot, you know. <laughs> they leave both your eyes in your head. You know, it's a pretty good deal. And so later in the war, this is after I left, when the guerrillas started getting hungry and they're just getting worn out, because we, the Special Forces guys, are doing the whole cheap in thing now, right? We got a 10-year plan. So we wore their asses out. And uh, when they started getting hungry, they knew they could come in and, and get taken care of. The other thing was advisor participation. Uh, we were prohibited from going on combat operations. We were not prohibited from accompanying units to do training. And we could do command level training, like we're going out to train the commanders of this group and all that stuff. So like that handsome guy right down there, you know, he puts in a, uh, a travel request, secret level, with the, these little CAC things we did. All it was, hey, I'm going out. And it was a story that the mill group commander could read. It's like, yeah, Major Taylor got his ass blown off because he was out training, doing a staff study, you know, with his, uh, or, or a staff walk, you know, with his Salvadoran officers. It was just an accident. They ran into the enemy. But as long as they could read your, your thing to the press and it sounded okay, or if you did get shot and the Salvadorans did what you told them to do, which is drag you to a rifle range and tell them it was a training accident, you're good to go. But what it did is it, it kept us out of winning the war for them. It kept us out of rambling it out with them. But it, when we did go with them, that was a huge, huge thing that, that, that we were out there accompanying them in the combat zone. And by the way, we didn't have any body armor. We could have had it. We could have had anything we wanted to, but uh, we did have pretty cool drive-on rags and, you know, Rambo rags and stuff. Rucksack had uh, a 10-day ration in it, which we ate in three days. Consisted of some moldy bread, uh, beef jerky cured in oranges, and uh, this homemade sugar, vanilla de dulce, which had a bunch of dead bugs in it. And for some reason, a little pack of chiclets, you know, we had in there. So that was an El Salvador on a 10-day ration. But mostly you carried uh, ammo and water, and you moved quickly. You could move as fast as the gorillas. And we couldn't do that in Afghanistan. You couldn't even go outside the wire half the places in Afghanistan without body armor. So, yes, sir, please. Wants to talk to somebody that 
got our team together, we discussed the situation, and this was, for me, it was betting on Barley's time, right? Because I knew that if we got caught, I was done. I just told my guys, I said, if you get caught with this M16, we can use the SF MCO tap dance thing and explain, hey, I'm demonstrating how to move with a weapon and my, my student soldiers and all that. I said, when that doesn't fly, you tell them I wouldn't get a chariot, but that's what I do. It's my way to get the chariot issue. So, the, the other thing about this picture you'll see, and years later we crept up on, on what we really needed to do as advisors, and we wore the El Salvadoran uniforms. And if we looked enough, if we kept our mouths shut and got a good tan, we could pass for salvos, you know. The only dead giveaway on that is on my M16. I got a four power scope, which is cool because if, if you know they'll they'll like your they'll like you as an advisor if you whack somebody at, you know two three hundred meters, which by the way that's a long shot when you're full of malaria and you know starving half to death all that stuff. But, so anyway, the thing with interpreters, uh, we in Afghanistan we were trying to use interpreters for everything, and you, the folks who work with interpreters know that. 
you have no idea what your interpreter is saying, you know. So I'd say one of the keys to us winning in El Salvador is we spoke the language, you know. We all spoke the language. So I got to tell you about one good idea I had. I was uh, with the Salvadoran lieutenants, and they're like, "Hey, Gus, down at Ilopango Air Force Base, they got M113 personnel carriers. They got two or three of them down there. Can you get us M113s?" He's like, "Sure, I'm sure we can get them. There's tons of those damn things, you know." So I, I talked to Ram Ramirez. And this is 1986, right? So my team sergeant, Ram Ramirez, five tour in Vietnam, he says, them things are freaking death traps, sir. You don't want that crap. Don't, don't give them any 113s. And so anyway, I got a little more interest in it here lately. This is later on after El Salvador. It's like who developed the first true MRAP? Anybody know in here? A hand? Anybody want to guess? I got it. I got gotcha. you. All right. It, wasn't, it was Rhodesia. The leopard in Rhodesia, and so, so how did that war go for him? You know, with that uh, MRAP, not worth a shit. Okay, and so basically, I, I don't want to steal my own uh, conclusions here, but South Africa was like the second ones to do it. They had a lot of MRAPs. So how did that war go for them? You know, this guy whipped their ass from inside prison. So once, you, if you're climbing in an MRAP or anything like that. You're probably losing the war if you're in counterinsurgency. And in Afghanistan, it's like who who wants these things? I don't know. Have you ever been in? in you've been in them, right? They're freaking terrifying. You're sitting there looking at each other, like <laughs> waiting for it to go boom, you know. And it's like hope it don't blow up. So uh, uh, I got a kick out of one time. Uh, a, a, a sort of commander was trying to figure out what to do with his MRAPs to try to get them into storage or get them evacuated. I said, sir, what you need to do with them is take all the guns off of them, take all the radios out of them, take the blue floors tracker out of it, fill it up with fuel, leave it running outside the compound, let the Taliban take them, and then we'll blow the shit out of them, you know? <laughs> he didn't see the humor. <laughs> anyway, getting back to El Salvador, how did we get around then? I mean, we got around in helicopters, or uh, mostly we got around on foot. There's foot patrols, right, Dave? And these are hairy patrols because we didn't even have artillery cover a lot of times. So uh, helicopters were the big deal. The aircraft we used, that A-37 Dragonfly right there, too many guns on it, four 500-pound high drags, awesome little aircraft, and it cost a total of $375,000 armed in those days, okay? Not, a, not one of these big jets, not you know, any of the other stuff, crap we use. That C-47 Phantasma. Worked pretty darn good. Except the gorillas were shooting red tracer just like us, so it was really hard to uh, get them to vector it in. But anyway, the first Gulf War. Uh, this is another one we did right. And I don't know why we did it right. It could have been because Schwarzkopf hated special ops too. But because of that, we had a very kind of rigid participation in the war. And uh, the biggest thing I think we did in this war was coalition warfare. Uh, and that was holding the coalition together because we could have, a, you know, a 10th group team with the French Foreign Legion or we could have a, a fifth group team that spoke Arabic, you know, with uh, the Saudi forces or whatever. So coalition warfare was a, a big piece of what we did right in that war as special forces cats. And then we did SR and direct action. And we even had Colonel Plummer doing unconventional warfare, although it went well. Got to my Afghanistan slide here. How are we doing on time? I don't know if I'll have time for Ernie and the Howler Monkey, but anyway, we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, I was in Afghanistan as a support guy to special ops doing uh, MacGyver support. We had teams of, of stuff. We'll talk about that here a little bit later. But uh, uh, what I saw from, as a support guy was that we had won in 2002, spring of 2002, SF on horseback, what, 15 A teams and two SEAL platoons? and a ton of arc lights. I mean, we won the war. The Taliban were running for, for, for northern Pakistan. The entire world was on our side at that point after 9-11. But then we got some help we didn't ask for that asked us to shave our beards off, go to the compound. We got it from here. And so the ground infantry units went and merrily blew the hell out of everybody. And within two years, it was the American War. 
Major Gant there, who they fired for various high crimes, he wrote a paper called uh, One Tribe at a Time. And uh, even later on, when we're still trying to do our SF job, uh, we're running into guys that, like Major Gant, who his high crime was, a, you know, he had some wounds and he was addicted to painkillers. And this really good looking reporter showed up and embedded with his unit, embedded a little too deeply, you know. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the Lawrence of Afghanistan, they threw his ass out of Afghanistan. Anyway, any, Chris, anything you want to say about Afghanistan? It would have been over. We'd, yeah, we'd have, yeah. I went in early. I was in there in January of 02 to be back with those business guys, and they went out. And it was still, still free running and gunning and doing things and embedded with the Afghans and all that. And we pretty much had it. There was two DeSoas in Afghanistan that were completely controlled by, by SF. One was DeSoa, Oklahoma, which is the whole Pakistani border, and the other one was DeSoto, Carolina, which is Oregon province, which was a you know, little on Lawrence place and all that. And, uh, Yeah, Chris, Chris Cornell, I don't know if you remember him, he just eventually came to work with us, and, and he was a 10th Mountain uh, commander that took Bagram Air Base, took the base as with his company, right? Then he ran up toward, uh, up north in the east someplace, and by the time he got back, his whole company got busted for speeding, you know, by MPs. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> at Bagram, so. All right, any more Afghanistan stories? We have one last story or two here to tell. Any Afghanistan stories? Going once, okay. So. How about Iraq? Hey, let's do, yeah. We've left Iraq out of that. Hi, my name is Les Kenny. Yes, sir. Wounded twice in Nam. Hey, thanks, sir. Let me see your face there, by the way. I'm, no, I'm prettier than you. I'm, I'm just gonna say, I, I need that. I need that gal's number, you know. <laughs> 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 
So I, I'm going to kind of wrap this thing up, you know, with uh, internal to special forces community. We need long-term strategies that are just as patient as the Taliban, that are just as patient as the uh, Ho Chi Minh. You know, we have to look at that fourth dimension of warfare. We also have to look at the fifth dimension, but it's still a little EBGB, you know. We, we kind of got to get that one sorted out scientifically. But the fourth dimension of warfare inside of special forces, uh, I want to tell you a quick story with the help of uh, Jay Osorio from 7th Group. In Colombia in uh, 2004, I was fortunate enough to get, I was commander of Charlie Company at the time, and I was fortunate enough to get Charlie 37, um, almost all the company into Colombia, quite qu quietly and uh, undercover secret kind of stuff to develop the national counter uh, narcotics response for Colombia. So uh, it was a blast. I, tell you, I have to tell you, Flip, I don't know who, Chris was there. You were in Colombia, right, in 84, 85? 85. Yeah, so anyway, Ambassador Tams, they, they almost assassinated him in January of 84, and then they tried to, uh, the drug guys, counter, you know, the narco-terrorists, they tried to kidnap a bunch of American school children, right? So they evacuated all the embassy families out to include the ambassador. And so uh, these are good special forces stories, right? So all these penthouses were empty in downtown Bogota. And uh, of course, I got Ambassador Tam's penthouse. It was really miserable. There was a sunken bedroom with a California king and a, a cedar-lined uh, sauna off there. And uh, I almost got a Colombian purple heart, you know, for falling down the stairs into my bedroom and stuff. But it, just like, it was just like in the movies. Every one of those penthouses had a satcom antenna hidden by a rubber tree and all that. So we were living in SF heaven in there. And the best part of it was is we weren't working for the mill group. We were working for a chief of station who they called Mad Mongolian. And uh, he basically gave me a sack of money and said, make things happen. And I said, what, what are our rules of engagement? And he's like, we don't do no stinking rules of engagement. What are you talking about? <laughs> Go take care of this, you know? So we, uh, we had a really good time in Colombia for about two or three years. And uh, one of the things that happened in Colombia that was really new to us is the Colombian uh, Intelligence Agency came, DOS. huh? DOS. DOS. I can't remember the acronym, but it sounds right. So anyway, what they wanted is, is they thought that special forces were really special guys, right? So they wanted them, us to teach them technical capabilities, technical surveillance, uh, remote blasting of claymores, all that technical stuff, right? And so uh, I'm looking around, and our own agency could not do it. No, they couldn't do it. They just or wouldn't do it because they were occupied up in uh, Costa Rica, really doing some tough missions up in Costa Rica, right? So anyway, uh, luckily on the on Charlie Company, we had a lot of crazy guys who had taught themselves how to, you know, pick locks, disarm alarms, crack safes. Uh, make electronic bugs out of crap that they bought on Radio Shack and all that stuff. So this technical capability stuff started in about 85. And we went to see the technical guy for the, what do you call it, the, the, the agency for the Colombians? DAS. DAS, okay. So the, the, the DAS uh, guy was uh, about my age now, big fat guy like me, had a, uh, had a uh, dirty apron, you know, work apron on. And that was it, and he was like, he was their technical branch, so, uh, and had hardly anything, you know. But anyway, we had a couple of Special Forces guys that, that really jazzed his whole operation up with all kind of cool stuff, right? And uh, there's a ton of cool stories to tell about those, those operations. But anyway, when we got back, it was a dream of mine to, like, put this back into Special Forces. And for 10 years, I got down to SOCOM after El Salvador, I was fought every inch of the way on it. And I was, no, we're not spies. We're not spies. It's like, hey, you know, we look through binoculars. Why can't we listen through microphones? You know what I mean? And so just, we just kept the pressure up. And I found a, a, a Navy SEAL. Uh, name escapes me right now. Also a dinosaur. But we basically got started with the initial training for special forces uh, at the commercial intelligence academies in Fort Lauderdale. So National Intelligence Academy. 
technical surveillance services and uh, started training people up in all this. So I'm trying to, I'm getting back to why we need this long-term view in special forces because years later I'd wind up in Afghanistan and I've just finished up doing the mini guns and I ran into Sergeant Osorio, I think you're E7 at the time. And uh, we just got to talking, seventh group guys, the seventh group was in an ad bond and uh, we were talking about the art of the possible, what could be done. And so uh, Jay asked us, hey, can we set this technical stuff up in, here in uh, Afghanistan? I'm like, sure, yeah, of course we can. So uh, you, you, why don't you tell the rest of the story, Jay? I'm gonna bring you the microphone. Thank you, Gus. Uh, first of all, this is truly an honor. Gus has been a mentor, but more importantly, a silent partner to this generation of Special Forces. And that goes with a lot of people that we've dealt with. So uh, I joined in 90, went to Desert Storm as a combat medic with the second ACR, so the tanks. You know, we did, we'd, uh, had a lot of issues there, but so I had 10 years of the, you know, the Vietnam era, the Central American era leadership that kind of molded us. When 9-11 hit, uh, I was on the first aircraft as a medic, first five aircrafts into uh, K2, Uzbekistan, and you know the war went from there. I think, personally, as we see here and we kind of hear these stories, there was this rapid evolution that moved at the speed of soft. You remember that, Gus? Yep. That's what sold a lot of these technical capabilities was the, was the speed of soft. How fast do we need to get to the enemy, disrupt the enemy, and do a lot of things? So I'll backtrack just a little bit. There's a lot of information of the evolution of how soft just from 2001 till current times just ran and basically took over all uh, strategic, tactical uh, operations. So big story, if folks don't know, in, in approximately 2005, the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said, you know what, I'm tired of dealing with these agency guys gals and gals, I need my guys, I need my special forces guys who are specially trained in advanced techniques to be at every embassy around the world so we can go after this global war on terror. And he did that. So what happened is, you know, you'd get one soft operator with special training in the embassy hanging out with all that new culture. And there were some good things and there were some difficult things, but we'll move on that and what happened later. All right. So now, like Gus said, we had moved into the intelligence operations world. Up to pretty much 2005, uh, they used to call these operations low-level source operations, low-level intelligence operations, low-level security operations. So that's the way we kind of operate. What happens, moving back to 2009, is we land in Siege of Sotov, uh, we're the C at the Siege of Sotov Command, and we have the uh, special programs uh, office, and then you just do, you know, it was only, we used to call it two guys in a closet, because it was a warrant officer and an NCO, just, and the commander would walk by, or the CSM, or somebody would say, hey, can you guys do this? Like, yeah, we'll give it a shot. So it was always, it was a nifty thing that was bringing soft back to that reason you were selected, to use your mind, to expand, you know, unconventional, unrestricted, asymmetric warfare. And so we did. Uh, a lot of things happened. So in 2009, as soon as we landed, the uh, Dust One Private Bergdahl had come out of his gate. And so we were part of this giant international um, a team of folks trying to find Bergdahl. So the underlying thing that happened there, Gus had already come in. We had already start, started talking about how we can evolve and how we can do from technical to all kinds of special programs to expand the soft capability. The good thing, kind of what happened is you had the whole world looking for Dust One, Private Bergdahl, and it was your special forces network that actually found them with a little help from the special science division. And we were able to PID where he was. He had crossed over into Pakistan within the Haqqani network, and the uh, JTF commander pointed it one E7, uh, CW3, and another E7 said, you guys got the lead on Bergdahl from this point on. The byproduct of that is that we became an interagency strategic option. 
So we can do things at very high levels, and that's where your force is at today. We're doing things at very high levels. All right, back to Gus. We, we were, you know, coming up, for me, doing the special plans coming up, we always had a, almost a little bit of a restriction, right? Everything was by doctrine, by doctrine, by doctrine. Working in the special plans group, Gus telling us the stories of what they did since the 50s with the special weapons, the special programs. Then we, from that point on, from the day Gus, Colonel Taylor stepped into our office, pretty much we changed the dynamic of warfare to include using satellite systems to find. We found some, uh, under personal recovery, we found some aircraft using satellite systems. I, I mean, it just, it went beyond anything we could ever imagine. Uh, and then to the end, the technical programs, I mean, we were building like uh, dipole antennas, build them into vests, and they were going out into the uh, rapid production systems. And then we built a ton of technical things that you can just put in a box and deploy it. So you'd have engineers in a box, you'd have communications in a box, you'd have uh, solar powered water heaters in a box. And, you know, basically the evolution uh, continued on there. Finally, the last step that I can tell the story now that I'm retired, sorry, Major Zetz, <laughs> is that Gus was our silent partner to this incredible idea that seemed revolutionary, which was creating, if you haven't heard, the 4th Battalion concept. So it's pretty much creating Jedbergs and special teams that go around the world. It's just one or two men, and then we create a lot of capabilities, which includes a lot of technical capabilities. But I'd like to say today that it was Gus who opened the door at our level, opened the, our minds to bring it back to the original SF mentality. And then from there, you've got an incredible capability today that's challenging all the interagency capabilities. Thank you, Gus. Thanks. Thanks. Damn, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I have to say, uh, tell one story on Colonel Alexander. When we were looking for Bergdahl, I thought, you know, Colonel Alexander knows some pretty creepy people, you know, that can kind of like, mm, you know, find folks. And uh, remember that, sir? I called you from Afghanistan. I don't know if you remember it or not. But anyway, uh, we actually didn't use any of those people, but there was another person that did help us find an old lady in uh, uh, New Mexico. I mean, right on him, right on him. So anyway, I think we're going to wrap her up here. I'm going to run down here to the last slide because there's one before I get to, uh, we run a little bit late, but there's nobody behind us that I know of, right? Colonel Alexander? We got a few more minutes? Okay. So we don't have to read off this slide. You guys can read it. I mean, pretty much, uh, you know, conventional forces should, shouldn't be in the counterinsurgency business unless invited or you're willing to do what Black Jack Pershing did and what the, we did in the Indian Wars. And we got templates for how to work well with conventional forces or without them. El Salvador being uh, an SF run show and uh, the first Gulf War being a uh, SF support to conventional forces. So what's the good thing about conventional forces is uh, with SF in support and what are conventional forces good for? I would argue it's not security assistance and it's not nation building and it's not any of that stuff. But they're really good at bitch slapping a country for doing something bad to the U.S. to go in and just, you know, blow the crap out of them and then leave. And they, kind of like we did in the first Gulf War. And we, a lot of us were like kind of bitter. It's like, why didn't we chase him down? Why didn't we kill him and kill that son of a bitch? We're going to have to do this again later, you know. And, but the truth was, you know, we achieved our objectives. And we didn't get mired down in another Vietnam or any of that stuff. So... Uh, the one thing I want to talk about on this slide is the, the game preserve phase. We got eight, was it seven phases of guerrilla warfare, right? Rand study. How many phases of guerrilla warfare did they teach you guys? Seven, right? So if you've been around this game long enough, you'll see an eighth phase of guerrilla warfare. And uh, Robert Duvall did it better than I could, but I'm going to pretend I'm him in Apocalypse Now. He's like, Napalm, you know, <laughs> napalm in the morning or whatever he said. I love it, you know, and everybody remembers that. They don't remember what he said right after that because he, 
He turns and he takes his calf hat off. He goes, damn, someday this war is going to be over. And what the eighth phase of unconventional warfare or regular warfare is, is going back to the fifth dimension. It's a deep psychological thing that's going on inside every senior officer, every senior NCO, in the junior and mid-grade officers. They would never admit to doing it, and they'd probably try to slap you if you said they were doing it. Nothing good happens to, to sergeants and officers when a war is over. And that drives their behavior. It drives it into a 20-year game preserve in Afghanistan so that the conventional forces can get stacks and stacks of awards, more promotions. And every, I mean, just about every one of those officers or NCOs would, in the conventional side anyway, would say, we hate war. Wait, war is horrible. It's like bullshit. If you hated war, you'd be a beautician or something, you know? They love war. And that's what makes these wars drag on when the conventional forces get involved. So subject to any more cool war stories or questions, I'll tell the story about Ernie and the Howler Monkey. This is the best SF story for my career because I was there when this happened. So anyway, uh, Chris, you remember Ernie Sparages? Oh, yeah. And you remember Nick uh, Bayer, also known as Nick the Prick? And, and Chief uh, Carroll, Jay Carroll? Jay Carroll's where? Is he in his room? The dog, he should be in here. He could tell this story better than I could. Anyway, uh, one of the ways that we established rapport with the indigenous folks we worked with was uh, we'd live with them. I mean, we, would, we didn't have blue, you know, blue shitters, you know. We didn't have mess halls with uh, lobster every Friday night and all that stuff. We, we just went into the, where the indigenous were and we lived there, you know, and, you know, if they crapped over there, that's what we crapped, you know, and it's like, you know, whatever they were doing, we were doing. We ate what they ate, no matter what. But um, anyway, back to the story. We were in a, uh, the Azuero Peninsula in Panama, and uh, now the Azuero Peninsula is full of old Spanish, kind of light-skinned, blue-eyed and all that. And so Jay's team, I was in there with Jay's team as a B-team leader, and I always carried this uh, 20, uh, 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 chrome-plated, uh, hard chrome-plated so it wouldn't rust, a, a 22 caliber Ruger. And what we did with that is we shot iguanas. And we established a lot of rapport just by shooting iguanas on Sundays. we take the little kids out because they could see them, they could see the iguanas. And, uh, they could guide us to where, where they were, and we'd shoot them down and have this big iguana stew, garobo, they called it. And so anyway, we were going to go get some fish with these cats. We were just hunter-gathering like they do, you know, and uh, we had a new guy on the team named Ernie Sparages, and he was from New York. And all the rest of the team, like Nick, was a bunkhouse cowboy from Texas, you know, and the team was pretty rag rough team, right? So uh, Ernie was sort of fitting in, but, you know, we were trying to, accommodate him because he's kind of a city boy and all that. So anyway, uh, we're walking down this trail to uh, go uh, net fish. And uh, Jay Carroll, the warrant officer, this whole bunch of howler monkeys comes running at us, you know, and they're doing the howler monkey thing, you know, throwing crap at you and yelling and hooting and hollering. And then the head howler monkey comes running down about for me to, to, to General Morris there, you know, standing up on this branch and yelling at us and stuff. And Jay says, Hey, sir, give me the jungle bitch, will you? The jungle bitch was what all my guys called this pistol, right? So I gave him that pistol, and Ernie's like, you're not going to shoot him, are you? And it's like, yeah, we're going to shoot him. We're going to eat him, too, you know? And uh, he said, don't shoot that monkey. Don't shoot that monkey. It's like, look, these people need food, you know? We use, you know we're hunting for food, and we're going to shoot this damn monkey, you know? And so he shot him in the eye, you know, and the monkey goes, Ey! you know, flips around upside down, hanging on upside down. And, uh, and Jay turns to our, our indige guy, you know, our indigenous guy, says, uh, that monkey's going to taste pretty good. And, and the indigenous guy goes, oh, we don't eat those things. They look, like, they look like humans, you know. And so then Ernie's like, really, you guys should have shot that monkey. You should not have shot that monkey. You're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. So anyway, we kept going down to the ocean, and we're netting uh, snook and all this other crap. And, and Nick was uh, this Texas bunkhouse cowboy, real quiet. 
he'd catch stray cats and make them into chili and stuff. And seriously, he, Nick was a cool guy. And he didn't like Ernie at all, right? So anyway, we're down there netting all this stuff, and Nick is just the toughest guy on earth. He goes, he says, sir, I'm really sick. He said, I gotta, I gotta go back to the village. He said, I can't, I can't keep this up. I just gotta go back, you know. So anyway, I said, okay, Nick, you know, you, need, you want somebody to go with you, you know? And he's like, no, I can make it back on my own. So anyway, he goes back up the trail, and we get done catching our fish. We got buckets of fish and all this stuff. So we're walking back up the trail, and Nick is there where we shot the monkey. And he's crying. It's like, this is a Texas bunkhouse cowboy, best sniper we got, and he's crying, you know. And we got up there, and uh, there's this mound down on a sandbar with rocks around it. And uh, Ernie says, what happened? You know, and he says, Nick says, I, I got up here, and all those monkeys was dragging that big monkey down into the sandbar down there, you know. And it was really sad. He, I says, he said, I never felt this bad, you know. And he said, they, the monkeys, they, they pack sand on top of them. And they're chattering and talking to each other. They're real sad. And they put rocks all around his grave. And he said, I was holding it together until they all started singing Rock of Ages. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Sure appreciate your time. It was a blast. Thank <laughs> you.